All right, so we'll session six of the seminar series uh, screening articles. Let me share the the guide that goes along with this session. So I've just put that in the chat. So if you go um, find the chat box, you'll you'll find that link. This is where I post the recordings and the PowerPoints uh, that I use for these presentations. Um, so I'll get this one posted as soon as I can. So again, this is how we got to this point of screening articles. So I assume you've run the searches, you've uploaded your results to Covidence, and now you're ready to begin screening articles. So here's an outline of what I'm going to be talking about during this session. So first of all, the two stages of screening. That's important to kind of go over the basics of how screening is done. The importance of having multiple reviewers and thinking about the inclusion exclusion criteria that one would develop in order to uh, perform the screening. So let's jump right in. So there are two stages of screening in a typical systematic or scoping review, uh, the title abstract screening and full text screening. So as the name implies with title abstract screening, you're reading the title and the abstract of the article and you're deciding either yes, this article is clearly on topic and one that I want to review. Maybe, you know, there's maybe not enough information in the abstract or title to tell me, but it looks like it might be promising, so that's a maybe. Or no, this is, you know, I'm interested in treatments of diabetes and this is about robots landing on Mars or something. This is totally off topic and irrelevant for my search. Um, so then it would be a no. Uh, and when you, as you recall, if you were here for the session on developing a search strategy, developing the strategy, um, you will heavily weigh towards uh, recall versus precision. So you recall, I recall that I spoke about there being these two two ideas with doing um, article searches in PubMed or any tool like that. You either there's recall on one end and there's precision on the other. Precision means that the articles you get are exactly on topic. So you do a search, 10 articles come back in your search results and you look at all 10 and they're all perfectly on topic. That's 100% precision. Recall on the other hand means you captured every single relevant article. So there's no way of knowing this, you know, so there's no way if I'm interested in uh, effectiveness of metformin for treating children with diabetes. I have no way of knowing how many articles are in PubMed on that topic. So this is kind of a theoretical, non-quantifiable thing. But th uh, recall means that in my search results, I got every single one of those articles. You know, I can never know this, but if it were possible to know, 100% recall would mean you got them all. So the thing is, with searches, when you maximize precision, you're minimizing recall and vice versa. And so when you're doing a systematic review in the search, you're trying to be exhaustive. So you're trying to maximize recall. That's why we spend so much time coming up with terms, synonymous terms, related terms, all the important terminology. And we just keep adding and adding and adding terminology. Um, the problem, well, the issue with that is I just, stated is that that's a very imprecise search, which means a lot of the articles you get are going to be off topic. So this is something I run into a lot with students where, um, or faculty or anyone is they'll do a search. We'll do a search together. They'll see, they'll screen through the first 20 articles and they'll say, well, there's only one here that's any good. You know, this search isn't very good. There's so many bad articles here, or irrelevant articles, but that's normal. That's the way it should be. So when you look at, uh, Prisma diagrams, and we'll look at one in a moment, you'll see they get rid of the vast majority of the articles. The vast majority of the articles, 95 plus percent usually, are deemed irrelevant. So you're going to have a, so that means one out of 20 is good if it's 95 percent irrelevant. So you're going to have a lot of irrelevant articles, and that's where the screening comes in. So your title abstract screening means you're going to get a lot rid of a lot of articles because they're clearly going to be wrong because you did such an exhaustive search that you got so many obviously irrelevant articles. So that's part of the process um, is doing 
that type of screening is getting that many irrelevant articles. And then this is where you start to hone in on the good articles. The second stage of the screening is full text screening. So as the name implies, you're reading the full article. So all the yeses and maybes from the first stage of the screening, you will read those articles, read the full text, and then you'll vote again. Should I include this or should I not? This is important for articles where like the maybes that I talked about, where there's not enough information in the abstract to tell you whether it meets your criteria, you'll have to read the full article to determine if it meets your criteria or not. Um, so those are the typical two stages of screening. And so here's a, I just pluck this out of some random uh, systematic review from a few years ago, and you can see they did their searches. They had 1,035 articles. 1,014 of them were deemed irrelevant, which means 26% were deemed relevant. So this comes out to, I think, 97.5% of the articles were deemed irrelevant. So that gives you a sense of the level of, you know, bad results or irrelevant results that you're going to see. In this, only 2.5% made it through the screening process. That's completely normal for this to happen like this. So, um, you should expect that. So that's the two steps of screening, and they sort of condense the two steps here. Oftentimes in a Prisma diagram, they'll elaborate during the title abstract screen. We got rid of this number, and then we did a full text screen, and we got rid of this number, and this is the number of articles we included in our study. Another factor here is multiple reviewers. You really want to have more than one person reviewing at each stage, although I've heard of systematic reviews where at the title abstract screen stage, you may have one reviewer. I, I think even that's kind of discouraged, but you absolutely need two reviewers for the full text screening. And the whole point of this is independence. So the reviewers are voting independently, using the same criteria, applying them to the same articles, but they're voting independently. And then you're tracking, and so Covidence does this for you, tracks how each person voted, and it tells you where they agreed or disagreed. Um, the point here is minimizing bias. That's something I talked about a lot earlier in terms of what is a systematic review, what differentiates it from other types of reviews. A big thing there is a significant effort is made to minimize bias. And so one of the ways you do that is having multiple independent reviewers at each step. Um, another interesting thing here is this expert versus non-expert. Uh, so at the title abstract screen, uh, it's not uncommon for people to use or to employ um, non-experts, people who are not experts in the field to do that screening. The idea is that if your inclusion exclusion criteria are written well and you take the time to train your reviewers, you should, a lot of people could do the reviewing. They don't have to be a subject expert to do the reviewing. Um, so, a couple things there. One is that you can have non experts. Typically, for the full text review, you're going to have someone who is a subject expert do that because they have to read the whole article and you know, pull out pertinent facts. Um, the other thing that's sort of implied by that is training. And this is very often, we're going to talk about inclusion exclusion criteria in a moment. You should go through a training process with your reviewers. And what that means is both of you pick a set of articles and apply the inclusion exclusion criteria to those articles and see if you independently come up with the same answers the yes maybe no if you don't you have to figure out why didn't you agree and it may be that something's not clear in your inclusion exclusion criteria something you thought was totally obvious but your other reviewer or reviewers didn't quite get or didn't read it the same way you did it's important to go through that uh, piloting step with these with this process to make sure everyone's on the same page but theoretically if your criteria are written well you should be able to work with even a non-subject expert and they should be able to review articles accurately and the thing is also that you'll have two votes per article so even if that you know you there'll always be more than one person 
looking at each article. So that minimizes the chance of errors, you know, some kind of systemic error introduced by someone who, you know, isn't qualified to review or something like that. Um, so those are some of the factors involved, the things you want to think about with multiple reviewers, but you should always have multiple reviewers for the different stages. And this is really important when you read systematic reviews, they often in the methodology will describe how who reviewed each, that more than one person reviewed each article. Um, that's important to look for, and it's something that you want to think of yourself. Um, okay, so let's move on to inclusion exclusion criteria. So this, these are the set of rules that you're going to use to decide which articles make it and which ones don't. You're going to have a preset a uh, set of rules for factors regarding the articles, which will cause you to either include them or exclude them. Um, so the screening decisions have to be based on criteria. And so there's, um, I'll just put it in the, whoops. We can actually just go here. So there's a chapter and I'll put it in the chat from the Cochrane Handbook. Um, on defining criteria for including studies. Um, the idea there is to think about the categories you're going to have for uh, inclusion or exclusion. And so you're, the, the ideal is to kind of a priori, before you even look at a single article, you've developed your inclusion exclusion criteria and that way you avoid bias. But in practice, that's typically not how it works because you're going to develop inclusion exclusion criteria. You're going to start to apply them and then you're going to realize, wait, there's something I missed. You know, I looked through 10 articles and there's some factor in them that I didn't even consider, but I don't want it in my article. So then you're going to have to make an exclusion rule and then you're going to have to start over again. Um, so the idea is, is again, piloting these rules. Number one, to make sure everyone is trained and uh, understanding the rules the same way. The other is to make sure that the rules are inclusive of what you want to get rid of or what you want to keep. Um, so some of the common areas where people apply inclusion exclusion rules are the PICO elements. So for population, if you say, I want to look at the efficacy of this treatment for diabetes, so your population is individuals with diabetes. So which diabetes, type one, type two, gestational diabetes, some other thing? Um, is there an age of the patient? You want all patients? Do you want children? Do you want adults? Do you want the elderly? And when you use one of those age terms, how do you define that? So for children, do you mean zero to 18? For elderly, do you mean 65 plus? You wanna think about carefully defining attributes of the population. For intervention, like let's say there's, in my example, it was like metformin for treating diabetes. I'd want to think about, well, do, does everyone use the same dosage in all the studies? Are there different dosages that people use? Is the duration of the treatment the same? You know, how long they get the treatment or the placebo? For other things, you want to make sure you have a common definition. So for metformin, it's metformin, but for something like massage therapy, what do they mean by massage therapy? Does everyone mean the same thing? You want to make sure that in the articles that you're analyzing, they're all using the same definition of it. Um, so those are some things with intervention. So rules that you might want to set, you know, I only want to look at metformin that was given in this dose with this time frame, so that the results you look at at the end are comparable. You don't want to have, you know, uh, results that were determined or that were arrived at with very different types of interventions, because it's hard to combine that data into one single analysis. For outcomes, this is a really important one to think of what are the specific outcomes you want. A lot of times people will say for improvement or for what's the efficacy of such and such. But what does efficacy mean? How are you defining that? Um, so for um, diabetes, does that mean uh, lower A1C values? Does that mean 
decreased morbidity? Does that mean decreased um, likelihood of amputation? I mean, what is effective? What does efficacy mean to you? You have to define that, and that's one of the things you're going to look at in your articles. Do they use the same measures of efficacy that you're interested in? Another thing is study types. So are you only interested in randomized controlled trials? Are you only interested in certain types of, you know, it has to be an experimental trial. It can't be a, a case control study or uh, not case, case control studies, experimental, but it can't be like a case series or case report. It has to be some experimental study. Um, you have to think of what, what restrictions do you want to apply to that? Also, do you want to avoid review articles. Typically, you don't want to include other review articles in your review because then you're counting data more than once. So if you include a systematic review, there's a good chance that you identified some of the same articles which were identified in that systematic review. So if you count the initial article and the systematic review, you're counting that data twice in a way. Um, language, of course, English only is not uncommon. Um, it's really important to think about language though, because in some, for some topics, it may be okay to just say English only. And for a lot of topics, that's true, but there are other topics where that's not going to be true. So I can think of an example of a systematic review that I helped some faculty with a number of years ago, which had to do with um, postgraduate medical education in Sub-Saharan Africa. So PGME in Sub-Saharan Africa. They, if they had limited to English only, they would have missed a lot of important articles because there's a lot of articles being written by individuals in sub-Saharan Africa, but the language they write in is not English. It may be French or something else. And if the people who did this study said, I don't want to consider anything that's not English, you have to question whether it would even be worth doing at that point because you'd be missing so much relevant information. The obvious caveat of that is if you get something in another language, you have to get it translated. So that's a cost to get things professionally translated unless you understand scientific literature written in another language, which you know, maybe you do. But uh, publication status. So do you only want articles from peer review or journal articles from peer reviewed journals? A lot of people will do that. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know that, that I would recommend that because at the end, and we'll talk about this in a few weeks, you're going to do a quality assessment of your included article. So if something is low quality evidence, you'll note that in your quality assessment. Um, and so you'll, you know, take that data into account considering that. Um, so I don't know that I would limit it in that way. Another one that people often want to do is year range. So I only want the last 10 years. I only want the most recent information. I would say to be very careful with that uh, because that can be biasing to say that. Um, uh, I usually recommend against limiting by year unless there's a specific reason to do so. So that I feel like there really should be a justifiable reason for excluding by year. So what I mean by that, or an example of that might be, um, oh, I don't know, if you, if something, if the definition of a disease changed, like let's say it's a psychiatric condition and um, a DSM, you know, DSM-5 came out and changed the definition of what this condition is, well, then it would be a confounding variable for me to consider articles written with the old definition and with the new definition because they're using the same word, but they're talking about two different things. So in that case, I might say, I'm only going to consider articles written since this DSM-5 criteria came out or something like that. Um, I feel like there has to be a justifiable reason for a date limit. Um, so anyway, those are some of the categories of inclusion exclusion criteria. So in conclusion for this, um, a typical systematic review screening is performed by multiple independent reviewers in two stages. 
so title abstract and full text. And the screening should be guided by well-defined inclusion exclusion criteria. And so there's the Cochrane Handbook, there's other resources. Another great way to learn about this is, as I always suggest to people, is just read systematic reviews. So look up a systematic review on a topic that interests you and see what question they were trying to answer and then what inclusion exclusion criteria they applied to their articles in order to help them best answer that question. And what you'll usually see is they pick inclusion exclusion criteria in order to make, to get rid of confounding variables in the article so that it's easier to answer to give a definitive um, answer at the end. Um, so I see a question there, which I will address uh, momentarily, but once I finish with this, um, so thank you again. I'm going to get to this question in a moment. The next session is November 10th, so as usual, every two weeks, and it'll be in this WebEx room, and that will be on extracting data. So this is, you've done your search, you've done your, you've um, identified your articles that made it through the different phases of searching, and now you're going to extract data. That'll be what we talk about next time. So let me move on to the question of adding inclusion exclusion criteria to Covidence. So let me go into Covidence. So the way you would do that, I'm going to go to just a practice review here. The way you add that in is you go to settings and then you'll see criteria and exclusion reasons. And then you just write out your inclusion exclusion criteria here. So I just type these, you know, whatever, type in whatever you want. Um, and then if I go back, I'm gonna leave page and I go to the screening here, the title abstract screen, now I can say show criteria and it's going to show me. It's going to always keep that at the top of my screen, the inclusion exclusion criteria that I wrote out in the settings. Um, so that's how to incorporate that into your process within Covidence. Are there any other questions about this topic? I see we're coming to the end of the allotted time. Yeah, I have a question regarding that. Thank you for answering my question and doing the demo. Mm -hmm. Um, because I currently did that, I guess I didn't go to the settings page to put an exclusion. Um, no, I, I did it a different way. Um, mm -hmm. I went to filter and then I put an exclusion and then those articles popped up. Um, but if you put in inclusion and exclusion, like how you just did, mm -hmm. do the ones that you want to exclude, do the do they disappear? Like, do you still have to no. no, this is just showing, reminding you of your reasons. I, I would be hesitant of using the filter in that way. Um, okay. Because let's say I want to exclude articles that are about type 2 diabetes. So I say, okay, show me all the ones that say type 2 diabetes, and then I'm going to get rid of them. The problem with that is an article an abstract may say type 2 diabetes, but it's not about type 2 diabetes. It may say like, contrary, unlike the situation with type 2 diabetes in patients with diabetes insipidus, blah, blah, blah. So they may use the words, but it may not be about that topic. Um, so that's why I'm always hesitant to do any kind of like, just look for this word and get rid of any article that uses this word. Um, because you don't know how the abstract is using that phrase. It may just be mentioning it, mentioning it in passing as opposed to it being like that's the, the um, subject of that article. So, the, so what you do with the inclusion exclusion criteria is it's just a reminder. So as I'm going through the articles, I'm, oh yeah, diabetes insipidus. Nope, not there, so that's no. Um, it's just as a reminder, it, it doesn't automate the process in any way. The point of the screening is that you are looking at each article sort of and seeing, you know, in your own mind, thinking over whether it meets the criteria or not. There's really no way to automate that process. Um, um, are there okay. other questions? Oh, sorry. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, I just, I'm just curious. So with the Prisma flow chart that will populate, so it won't ever really include what was the number that was excluded or included? You just write that manually? Um, well, the Prisma flow chart and Covidence will keep track as you go along. It's mm -hmm. updating constantly. Okay. Um, so what is it screens for the full text review? I think we talked about this last time, but you can have it give you a drop down list of reasons for exclusion okay. and then you pick one. So every time you exclude, you have to pick one of the reasons and then it'll add that to the flow chart. Um, but for Covidence, what it's doing is as you're screening, it is updating this chart in real time. Okay. Um, yeah, so one, I'm sorry. Uh, and so, if, like, to get rid of an article, like on mine, it needs two votes. So just because I vote on it, it won't change the Prisma diagram. The other person has to vote on it as well to change the Prisma diagram because each article requires two votes. Um, so I'm sorry, what's the, what was the question? Um, I wanted to know, like, if you can go back, like, let's say I quickly went over an article and put no, but it's like, you know what, maybe I should have put it as maybe or yes. You can't go back. Uh, what you can do, I believe, is if you said no, then it got moved to irrelevant. Mm -hmm. um, what would you be able to do with that? Oh, I can say move study to screen. So I can say move the study back into the screen and then I'm going to rescreen it. Um, so you could do that. So you can go into the irrelevant articles and then say, Okay, I made a mistake. Move them all back into the screen. I have to rescreen these articles. Um, that's that's something you could do. Thank you. All right, you're welcome. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. So, are there any uh, final questions? If not, I will just hang around here till everyone uh, exits, and then we'll close it down. So I'm going to stop the recording.